We've already talked about how uh, violence is uh, one of the, the main tactics uh, of Antifa, and it's not just reserved for, you know, uh, as you would term, you know, the radical right people they view as fascist. Uh, they also uh, protest at uh, political events where, you know, conservative uh, politicians are speaking. We only saw uh, just last month uh, Tony Abbott's uh, sister, uh, Christine Forster, attacked on her way onto uh, a liberal fundraiser. So they, they clearly uh, believe that, you know, all this, you know, violence is justified because they, they view their opponents as not they're, they're not simply people that they dis disagree with. It's They view them as evil and bigoted. And so any type of uh, violence uh, against them is, is justified and virtuous. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's the moral trolley experiment. So these conservatives, um, you know, a lot of these conservatives, like they, like, you know, uh, are, would be against you know, a lot of examples of, of racism and sexism in their, you know, mainstream traditional terms, not the crazy terminology of the neo-Marxist where, you know, a white person with dreadlocks is suddenly racist. You know, the, the, the radical left is actually, I mean, think about how many thousands of years did it take for being against racism and sexism to become a mainstream value in society? How, how, how many thousands of years did that take, right? And I feel that these people are eating that social fabric. They're cannibalizing it for instant gratification. And what I mean is like, so if a child, you know, cries and its mother constantly attends to it, it will learn that it can exert power over its mother through crying or whatever. So I think we too do that as adults. If I go, oh, that person's racism, that person's sexist, other people will turn around and pay attention, right? And so, in that sense, there's a there's a form of, of, of power that you can wield by by sort of using these terms. And just like any currency, the more you print it, the lower the value becomes. So they're overusing their overuse of terms like racist, sexist, and even defining moderate right wingers as fascists actually provide a perfect smokescreen for actual racists and sexists and actual fascists to be able to operate in the mainstream. But I also think that deep down they want they want there to be a radical right wing movement, um, you know that that's out there so that they can justify recruiting and and their sense of meaning and purpose in life. But yeah, they they are willing to use violence against anyone that they perceive as helping, because they believe everything is culture, right? I mean, it is in a way, but they believe that, you know, even someone saying something that they think is racist by abstraction. Um, you know, that doesn't fit the, 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 the mainstream conventional understanding of those terms, they think as enforcing some sort of oppressive society and they feel justified in assaulting them. I mean, you know, what they did to Tony Abbott's sister and, and Andrew Bolt, I mean, the principle, see, the radical left, they don't actually believe in principles. They see everything as a power struggle, right? So politics, and, I, and unfortunately, I see this happening more and more on the right too, Politics seems to be um, not about principles anymore, and it's sort of turning into like ideological football, where people are just cheering on their team, and they don't care about any of the rules of the game anymore. Everything's fine as long as your team's winning, and um, and so yeah, that I mean, but the principle that they're entertaining, like the idea, okay, Andrew Bolt is like an avatar for tens of thousands of Australian citizens, right? Okay, lots of people think like him. Are these radical leftists now saying it's okay to assault anyone with the views of Andrew Bolt? Okay, and then where does that lead us in the future? Okay, th that means that those tens of thousands of people are now justified in attacking any 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 left winger. I mean, it, it's it, it, they're try what the actions they're doing are trying to degenerate society into some sort of toxic thing where no one can talk to each other anymore and there's no debate and it's just about violence. I mean. You know, after I, you know, went through four years of being an ideologue thinking like this, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about psychology to understand what the fuck what happened to me. And one thing that Cole Young suggested is don't listen to people's alleged motivations, what they say they're doing. Ask yourself, is what they're doing really an excuse for them to be, A, lazy, and then B, malevolent, right? And, and I have to ask myself that about these Antifa people. I mean... What requires more effort, attacking someone or constructing a well 
reasoned, well-informed um, uh, piece of debate and speech to articulate a point. What requires more effort? Well, probably, um, you know, the, the writing uh, a position and thinking it out requires more effort than assaulting someone in the street. And what, what's more benevolent? Or, or malevolent, trying to debate and reason with someone to try to show them your point of view and, and, and work with them to try and work out what the truth is or assaulting them. What's more benevolent and malevolent? You know, I think that these people, that there's, there's a massive malevolence and laziness that runs, runs through what they're doing. And it also appears to me that media manipulation is uh, one of their tactics uh, always, you know, post these type, uh, type of events. And it's uh, it's quite shameful that our mainstream media, you know, uh, basically buys what they say. I mean, because uh, on the news coverage, it's always like, oh, you know, f uh, you know, right and, you know, left wing groups clash when it's, you know, it's a, you know, right wing rally, which the, you know, uh, Antifa has come to, well, I wouldn't use the word counter protest use the term try to uh, shut down with violence and then you know they obviously get a lot of press coverage on you know talkback stations where they actually you know spread you know heaps of you know misinformation that you know oh the police you know uh, assaulted us when we were just you know protesting or the you know the uh, i heard one recently that you know the police are you know uh so racist against you know the the african community like ju like just like you, you can tell that it's uh, that it's you know blatant lies. Like first, like are, are, uh, do they uh, you know go in with a plan to manipulate the media, and how do they feel that they're justified in you know basically spreading these outright lies? Um, well, yeah, I mean it's interesting. I, I would say that they actually kind of believe their own bullshit. They get high on their own supply, so. You know, there are some high-profile cases where Indigenous people were um, died in police custody and, you know, a, a lot of the details of those stories are, are unclear and, you know, maybe the, the, the police uh, neglected their roles in some of them and, you know, um, but, you know, there's obviously... But they take something... They take, like, one thing that, that has happened and then they extrapolate it and make it a universal, right? So now, all of a sudden, it's not just... Um, you know, bad policing or potentially bad policing, it's now the police hate Aboriginal people. Do you know what I mean? And, and they, they turn it into a universal. And, um, and, and I, I think it's, I think it's, oh, I think it's, they kind of believe these narratives that, you know, I mean, okay, so let's break down an example. So at the Milo protest, you know, they went there um, to these sort of immigrant areas where there were like, you know, a lot of sort of uh, ethnic and, and I think Muslim populations. And I think they went there and they hyped up and encouraged, um, you know, those communities to believe that, okay, we need to do this kind of violent protest and throw stuff at the radical right wingers. They're trying to kill you guys. They're trying to kill you. And then, you know, I think their young people sort of reacted or maybe got swept, swept up in the chaos. I mean, I've been in these kind of riotous situations and it's, it's almost like the, the, the social forces of what's going on will take over, take you over. And, you know, so there were these images of some of these ethnic kids, like, getting getting involved or whatever, and then the police, you know, maintained a presence and, you know, had to show force. And, you know, I'm not an expert on policing. I don't know if it's the right or wrong thing to do, but it's not clear to me by any stretch that the police were involved in some sort of conspiracy to, you know, attack ethnic communities. But... You know, they, they have a presup... See, the radical left can only see the negative side of society. Everything is predicated on oppression. That's what they see. They believe we're living in some oppressive, white supremacist patriarchy, right? I mean, what, what a garbage premise. I mean, what they do is they build an argument and they look for information that only validates their pre-gone conclusions that we're living in some oppressive society. I could build... But they, they don't build a case to say to, to, to examine the opposite point of view. So I could actually build an argument to say that Australia is one of the least one of the least racist societies that have ever existed in the history of the world and on the face of the planet right now. Right? We have it's illegal in any public or private institution to uh, to dis discriminate based on sex or race. Right? You know, if we're living in a white supremacist society, why do we have laws against it? You know, they'll, they'll take, you know, one one example of, of, of some sort of unscientific 
sort of uh, pseudoscience social study, and then they will go, oh, look, that's proof as that the whole system is corrupt, and now we're justified in, ha and hating it and ripping it down. I mean, if we live in an oppressive patriarchy, I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, like, like if men were involved in something, they talk about the men in the same way Nazis talk about the Jews. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, the Jews are just sitting around gathered in some sort of conspiracy against everyone. You know, like, as if men are just meeting up against everyone or whatever. You know, if men wanted to oppress women in Australian society, we could do it in, in a, you know, in a day, right? Like, like obviously, that's... See, what happens is the image of the individual gets destroyed, you know, and group identity takes over um, in these people's minds. But in terms of the media um, placating to it, I mean, I think... I think people, I think, intuitively understand how pathological and dangerous the radical right can be. I think because our societies historically were involved in fighting against, you know, Nazi Germany and then seeing the atrocities um, that that regime unfolded through their, you know, group narrative stuff. But I, I, I think that people will have less of a consciousness of the atrocities that communist societies have committed. Right? I don't think people are fully aware of how brutal um, the gulag systems were, um, how ridiculous and manufactured that um, the mass starvation was, and that it was a result of, you know, ridiculous um, purgings of, of people who were pr productive in that society that resulted in famines. Um, I, I don't think they, they have any idea how pathological communist societies got because our society wasn't directly involved in fighting it. And a lot of the atrocities of communist societies happened internally and domestically rather than happening, um, you know, with, uh, say, the expansion of, you know, Nazi Germany invading other countries. I think that's one of the factors why the media will be more sympathetic to the radical left. Um, and I also feel that as things have descended more and more into a political, um, you know, a, a, into a, a sort of political football game, you know, I, I won't, the, the moderate left-wing people, like people who might work in the ABC, won't look at their crazy radical flank, because what's more important is beating the other side, right? Rather than following through with principle, you know, and, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's not, it's about power struggle now, it's not about principles, and that's fucking dangerous. And and then the other factor is, of course, the, um, the proliferal, proliferation of, of radical left-wing ideas in university campuses um, through kind of pseudoscience studies like ethnic, um, ethnic and gender studies that basically fall back onto sort of a Marxist and postmodernist um, tools of analysis rather than, um, you know, biology or, or psychology um, as, as, you know, like why isn't biology uh, a course in gender studies, you know, because they've got a pre gone conclusion that the gender is a social construct because they, you know, it comes from a Marxist idea that human nature is determined by the economic forces of history, which I disagree with. Marx was wrong about that. And then, you know, and, and, and then so they, and that's, people want to believe that human nature is infinitely malleable because then we can achieve a utopia, you know. And, uh, and I don't know why anyone ever takes Marx seriously. I mean, the dude, I mean, the dude, was writing about the evils of capitalism while his best mate and collaborator was a capitalist. And he, and then Marx was being funded by the surplus value of this factory. And he would like, you know, and I think Marx is, is a good story because he, he, he kind of like the original vampire of the radical left. And that this was a guy who had illegitimate children. He didn't, he wasn't involved in raising and he was an alcoholic. So he neglected his personal responsibility, but the way he could justify neglecting his personal responsibility is through these radical uh, grand narratives of changing the world. Oh, I don't need to worry about that. I'm saving the world, you know, through. And so he, I'm, and yet he's writing a book about the exploitations of capitalism while being funded by a capitalist. Like, could you imagine taking seriously someone who wrote the evils of pedophilia, but his mate was running a pedophilia ring and he was being funded by that pedophilia ring? You know, Marx wrote in his book, um, I'm not worried about individual capitalists. I'm worried about capitalists as a system. You know, imagine writing, I'm not worried about individual pedophiles. I'm worried about pedophiles as a system, 
right? You would never take that person seriously. I don't know why Marx is ever taken seriously. So I went on a big rant about Marx, but... Um, yeah, and that's another you know, thing about just... uh, Antifa and these other far left groups is they, you know, preach about, you know, they they care about, you know, the poor and poverty. Yet uh, they all, most of them, come from, you know, privileged uh, backgrounds. They they've never uh, experienced what it's like to be, you know, a, a disadvantaged. And if they, you know, do live in, you know, poverty now, it's mainly by choice. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just like I was talking about Marx, this narrative of like, oh, I'm relating to this grand narratives, um, it abdicates them of any kind of guilt for having unearned privilege. Um, and then they can also abdicate the responsibility. So one of the main leaders of Antifa Sydney, um, well, the leader pretty much, he, he went to the same private school Tony Abbott went. So, and he grew up like on the North Shore in the rich area. Right. And I think being born with that level of privilege is, is a bit of a burden because like, OK, you've got all the opportunity in life. Now live up to it, kid. You know, go become some, uh, you know, go do something amazing, you know. But instead of that, he can kind of avoid that that fear of failure and that uh, the, the difficult burden of living up to that through these ideological narratives. I also did an interview with a, uh, a, a former ex far leftist, um, Julie who was involved in um, in sort of the advocacy for refugees. Now, she would actually go teach these refugees English and, you know, help them pay their bills and stuff because they couldn't read and stuff. But she was told by the socialist group that she was part of not to do that and instead to spend her time selling the newspaper for the party because there's no point helping individual refugees because if we achieve the revolution, then the main problem that's causing refugees will be gone. There will be no borders and we'll live in some utopia. And so I actually think that the utopian narrative actually allows people to abdicate their personal... This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.